Well, hello, 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 and welcome once again to 25 O'Clock. I'm your host, Dan Drago. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me on the show. Here we are, Philadelphia's longest-running music podcast, I think. Great show this week. Cool show this week. Talking with Brian Walker, A Day Without Love's Brian Walker. I believe this is his third full episode appearance on the show since I started. Uh, I believe he ties Nick Greeley now for most full-length episodes, those guys. Uh, Sooner or later, people are going to start, we're going to start having kind of like an SNL style five timers club or something like that. But I think a three timers club is pretty good. So right now, I think that three timers club is Brian Walker, Nick Greeley. There are other people. Uh, I, I can't. I can't remember, but those are the two that jump out uh, in, in, in my head. Uh, like Jay Vertibello is close too. Uh, he's at least two. Um, so yeah, have a little three timers club here on, on 25 o'clock and Brian Walker uh, is a member of it. Uh, we'll talk more about Brian and his new record uh, from his band, A Day Without Love, in just a moment. But as always, if you're new to the show, old to the show, medium to the show, I highly recommend you check out 25oclockpod.com. That's our space, our place out there on the internet. Everything's there. All the episodes available for streaming and for downloading. It's all there. No paywall. None of that stuff. Sign up for the email, the email list. I send you an email every time there's a new episode, and that's it. I don't send you excessive emails. Uh, I just send you the email for when there's something to email you about. That's that's what I do. Uh, you can also hook up with us on the socials. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. We're on Blue Sky. That's about it. And of course, check out the Friends and Neighbors page. I link anyone and everyone who's ever been on the show. So if you like an artist and you like what you hear and you want to support them, go to the Friends and Neighbors page. Click away. I've made it so very, very easy for you to do so at 25 o'clock pod. Dot com. Also, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash 25 o'clock pod. One level of support, I believe it is $5 a month. I believe. I invented it. It is. It is $5 a month. For $5 a month, you can support the show. I'll send you a nice thank you note with my heartfelt sentiments. And I send out CDs and records and things that I get. Like I've mentioned before, bands like to send me records. And sometimes they send me more than one, which is super, super cool of them. These records cost artists money, so I'm always incredibly touched when they want to give me not just one, but more than one. Uh, um, but I don't, you know, I don't need multiples. I'm good with just one, uh, so I can share that out there with you. So if you join the Patreon, you get to be part of, think of it like a completely sporadic record club. It's not record of the month. It's not that regular. Uh, it's it's spora- sporadic record club uh, where I just randomly will send you CDs and records at some point. Um, could be three times a year. Could be once. Couldn't tell you. Couldn't see into the future like that. But anyway, go to patreon.com slash 25 o'clock pod and hey, Help us out if you can. It costs money to run a podcast. Not a lot of money, not all the money, but, you know, some of it. So, you know, you can help. You can help keep the show free for everyone. Anyway, what else we got going on before we talk about Brian? Oh, yeah, this weekend, if you're listening to this show, the week it comes out, February 10th, very, very cool show at Johnny Brenda's. I will be there. Uh, I say this now. I will be there. Um, great show. Johnny Brenda's on February 10th, which is a Saturday, I believe. It is Saturday. Mustafa Nubisi and Nick Greeley, the aforementioned Nick Greeley. Mustafa Nubisi and Nick Greeley at Johnny Brenda's, February 10th. You got to go. It's going to be a killer show. I love both those guys. Mustafa was on back on 289. Nick Greeley's been on a bunch of times. His most recent episode was episode 284. It's going to be a killer show. Uh, I guarantee you those two guys met playing basketball. Uh, I that's that's my my bet right there if if I was a betting man which I am not and it's a really really weird thing to bet on how two people met each other but uh, I'm pretty sure they met playing basketball anyway go to that show Johnny Brenda's February 10th Mustafa Nabisi and Nick Greeley I'll be there I think most likely anyway let's talk about Brian Brian Walker has a new record out right now under his band name A Day Without Love the record's called A Stranger That You Met Before it's out on Your Mom Records uh, Brian was originally on, I think back on episode 52, that was in 2016. Uh, and then he was on 201. He was on like my, my episode after 200. He was 201 in June of, uh, 2021. Uh, I played his music a bunch. I talk about him a lot. Uh, he, he's a killer dude, a great songwriter, a super like just hardworking, always doing stuff. Uh, he recently moved to the Boston area. I think a little less than a couple years ago. 
Uh, but he was a very, very key part of the uh, DIY scene here in Philadelphia. He ran the uh, Philly DIY page on Facebook for many years, uh, not to be confused with the DIY Philly page on Facebook, which exists right now. Not the same thing. But he was uh, he was part of that world, and he still comes back and plays Philadelphia regularly. In fact, he'll be back on February 24th at Silk City playing a great show with Sammy Rybread and Stone Cold Grace. So you definitely want to check out that show as well. I will likely be there. Uh, but yeah, new record called A Stranger That You Met Before. It's very, very good. I just got mine in the mail recently. And yeah, always happy to talk to Brian. Always, He and I always vibe well. He's got He's got great point of view great thoughts, great opinions. And it's interesting to hear him kind of talk about similarities and differences between the scene as he knew it here in Philadelphia and the scene that he's kind of become a part of in in, in the Boston and New England area. It's always, always great to talk to him. So let's do it. Let's stop talking about how great it is to talk to Brian Walker and talk to Brian Walker. (laughs) Here it is. My man, Brian Walker on 25 o'clock. Now the basement is fully wired, man. We're not, we're not relying on the air anymore. We've got wires. I love that. <laughs> wires, man. That's. I kind of return to like, no, no, no. Just plug it in. Like, can you just literally plug those two things into each other? Like with my soundbar and my television, they're like, you could connect this via Bluetooth. I'm like, I have a cable that will connect this. <laughs> true, true, true. Well, awesome, man. We haven't talked since, like, or at least not officially, uh, since you were episode two hundred one back in June of twenty twenty one. It's entire, and you'll be you'll be shortly after number three hundred too. I guess it's your 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 place to 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 follow up the the big number, and then we have you on. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I love that. No, I appreciate that, and congratulations. Yeah, yeah, my gosh, yeah. And how many have you done with with Dreams Not Memes? I know you're kind of in a pause area with it, but... Yeah, I'm at 339, and this year I'm bringing it back. Um, A friend of mine just joined this, like, network of uh, musicians where they're all around the world, and she has a list of 100 musicians and their emails. And, like, while the podcast was, like, not intended to only be about music, there are 100 musicians all from countries... Well, not all, but like 40 of them are from countries I haven't interviewed yet. And yeah. I have exactly 70 countries left. So... Oh, we <laughs> might do it. <laughs> yeah, so um, sometime this week, I'm going to just message them all and see their availability and schedule there. And then for the final 30 regarding uh, countries, I'm going to have to do a like a bit of a lift and shift. Because, like, there's no way I'm going to find anyone from North Korea. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I've gotten a lot of war-torn countries already. Like, I've already interviewed someone from Palestine. I've already interviewed someone from Israel. But, like, places like in Africa, that's going to be kind of hard. I've already gotten Lebanon. Um, so that's that's the lift and shift saying, like, I've done almost all of the world, you know. Yeah, but, hey, yeah. you've, you've, you've done more than probably literally nearly anyone else. So. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But otherwise, like, yeah, just the past, like, seven months was really just focused on music and working. So I, I, I couldn't. You you turned these out pretty fast, too. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you had like a, I remember when you first started it and you, you kind of laid out to me how you're going to do it. And I thought to myself, I was like, oh, if I could do it like that, I could put out 500. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's, I'm like, but for some reason I'm, I, I do it the way I do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that's completely yeah. fair. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cause you had the record, you had the record come out this year. Um, mm-hmm. I think I texted you, I think I texted you from an airplane. Uh, yeah. You're, you're just in like, Japan. Yeah. I was like, I'm about to take off, but the last thing I did before I lost my connection was, oh shit, I better order Brian's album real quick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that was. I'm. I'm looking forward to. It. I've, I've. I've certainly heard it uh, a few times uh, by this point, and some of those tunes I was familiar with too, because you had been putting them out uh, a beforehand. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you got like a full band. You. You did the thing that I know you've talked about for for years. You always wanted to get a to get a band behind you, uh, yeah. as well as being a solo performer. Uh, you, you found all these cats, uh, out in your new digs in, in Massachusetts. Yeah. And, and they're very much in a transitional role because the record that's out now, 
that was all done by like Philly people and one DC person. But the record I'm writing now, oops, spoiler, I've never told anyone. <laughs> I'm going to be writing that with them. So like, it's still going to be kind of like, I wrote the song, but then this time it's not like I'm a hundred percent writing the bass. Liam yeah. will write the bass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. Uh, how did, how did you meet them? How did, how, how did you find them? It worked out so well. So like uh, sad story coming. Uh, I met someone in Philly and she was originally from Massachusetts then we broke up in Western Mass. So Western Mass is like, um, uh, have you heard of Carnegie, Pennsylvania? Like, th th there's nothing there. No, I mean, well, that that's probably why I haven't heard of it. <laughs> exactly. So I was living in the equivalent of Carnegie, Pennsylvania, many hours from Philadelphia. And the day she kicked me out, I had a music, music video shoot in Cambridge, which is like a city of Boston. Yeah, and I was just all like, wow, Boston's calling me, right? Because I have this music video shoot and I'm not going back, right? And I have to live here now. <laughs> yeah, I literally have to live here because I had enough money for an apartment. I just had to find the apartment. So yeah. uh, my music video director and my friend, and my friend is my drummer, but I didn't know it yet. I'm just like, uh, yo, can I crash with y'all? So I stayed there for two weeks, found an apartment, uh, found my roommate through uh my drummer um and next thing you know like i had this one gig like four months later so it was like early 2022 and uh my, my drummer justin arena just goes yo it'd be pretty cool if uh, i drummed for you and uh you had a full band i was like who's gonna be my bassist and guitarist and like my bassist at the time was like oh my friend will play guitar for you and i'll play bass for you since we jammed that one day and it literally just happened like that <laughs> then i had one lineup switch with the bassist and it just turns out that three-fourths of us all live in the same neighborhood so like oh easy. even when we're not practicing we're at a show or something so it, it's very easy no, that is good that is good that's yeah. that's that's the old that's old school it's the old way you just <laughs> yeah meet you just meet people and they're just like, can I be in your band? And you're just like, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, No audition year. process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I already knew them from like other bands too, so it like worked out. And um, what's also cool is like we did a little, like a very, very DIY tour from Denver to Boston, and we did play one Philly basement show. Um, and there's a video of that uh, by Shadow Studios' YouTube channel. And uh, it's like... A pretty rough performance to be honest with you because we were like 11 days in and the the room was smoky and a bunch of other stuff but like yeah uh, yeah no it's been really fun to do both full band and and acoustic shows so yeah 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 there, i mean there's just there's there's a there's a power to the music when you get drums behind it and things yeah. like that and yeah. like you can and then you don't have to focus because i know it's always hard to, as a solo musician you have to like you have to carry the room just with your own personality uh, you have to carry the room with your own songs and like kind of rhythmically you have to carry the whole room too. So when you yeah. have, when, when you can kind of like hand that over to other people, it's always, it's always a good thing. Exactly. And, and we really like play off each other. Cause like we are four very different people, but like there's some things that we just like agree on. Like, like I think we really got close during that road trip because we were listening to things like My Chemical Romance and having like deep conversations like, is this a good band or are they a queen cover band? Because like, let's be real, there are some things about My Chemical Romance that are very queen-esque. And then we broke it down. Yeah. We agree that My Chemical Romance is a great band. <laughs> but, but, like, yeah. I yeah. think you can be a great band and also a queen cover band. Like, uh, exactly. I think there've been many, there've been many great. I think Muse became at some point sort of a queen cover band. So exactly, uh, yeah. Um, but the, hey, it worked. It worked. Hey, exactly. If, if you're gonna rip something off, then it might just rip rip off a really great thing. Don't rip a off great like a not great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've always Queen has always always been in my life since I was a kid. So like that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so you put the record together. You said you did a lot of that in Philly, and then I know you mm. moved to Mass, and now you move further into Mass. It's so funny when you first moved when when you had said that like you were leaving Western Mass, uh, like you're on socials, and you're going to Boston. I have such a complicated relationship with with Boston that like okay. I wanted to slide into your DMs and just be like, "What's going on? Why? I don't know if you should do this." Like, True. Just... Well, to be even clear, I live in Quincy, which isn't exactly like Boston proper, but like I know it's... Quincy, yeah, yeah, but like um, 
it's still like in the greater Boston area. And I, I will definitely clarify as a Philadelphia native, I would never live in Boston proper. There's so there's so many nightmares. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how you would do it. <laughs> yeah. It's just uh parking. Uh yep. I mean, granted, it's not as bad as Philly, still parking. It's not uh, it's not great. <laughs> every everything's a circle and a square. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you get it. Yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah, no. I, I, it's, it, it's so weird. Like I, I talk a yard of shit on Boston, but I've also played amazing shows there. And uh, when I was more active touring, some of our closest relationships with other musicians were all out of Boston. Yeah. Um, so it's like if you could be a musician in Philly or you could be a musician in Boston and get anything going, then it, it often felt like you had like sort of this bomb. Where you're just like we're making it happen somehow True. in these places where everything is working against us. Yeah. And, and, you know, I will say there still is that like Boston, Philly, uh, inter intra touring comparison. Yeah. That's very similar. Like case in point, like in the same way that a lot of Philly artists will go across the bridge to Newark to play. Uh, our Newark is Providence, you know, yeah. a lot of people yeah. go to Providence and like, Hey, you want to go up north? Uh, instead of New York City, a lot of people play in New Hampshire and Portland. Not as big of a yeah. community, but still similar experience. Um, oh, Portland's so, a great town to. Yeah. I I always loved playing Portland, Maine. Like yeah. I always had a great time up there. Uh, there's schools, there's art, there's great food. You're right on the water. It was. Uh, I always enjoyed Portland uh, and Providence too. I always dug Providence. No, and, and yeah, and, I, and I've gotten to play there a handful of times, and uh, yeah, I plan on doing some, like, Canada runs, too, because it's so close. Ooh. Oh, man, so. Montreal. I've never played... Have I played Montreal? I know. This, this is what happens when you get old. I don't think I have. I've been gotcha. to shows. I've been, I've been to shows in Montreal. Uh, I played them in Toronto, uh, but I used gotcha. to live... I used to live in that part of New York. Um, Montreal is such a kick-ass town. It's just... Yeah. It's it's a place I always say to myself, I'm like, I got to spend more time up there. Except for about six, seven months out of the year, it's like incredibly inhospitable uh, weather-wise to like try and go to Montreal. True. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I'm going to time it. Like I have to do yeah. it in the late spring or summer. Cannot do it now, you know? Well, they're, they're, a they're, they're a city too that like when the weather is good, like they don't go inside. Like they, yeah. they, they understand there's like, okay, we got four and a half, five months right here. Just everyone be outside for five months. Exactly. Uh, and there's like, there's like festivals, like literally like every weekend. Uh, and there's like outdoor live music and outdoor stuff, like literally every day of the week. So like, and people like really celebrate it. Like they're really, they're like, we get to go outside. We're not being pummeled by snow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah, definitely. That's, and like great music and art scene up mm. there. Um, and great food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I used to date someone that, uh, was born in Montreal and she didn't get too much time there, but her mom like lived there for years. And she said like, yeah, given the way you talk about food, play oh, in yeah. Montreal. So oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You might not come back. <laughs> <laughs> And hey, who with with uh, I don't know with the state of the world, maybe that's not the worst place to end up. <laughs> no, 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 you're not wrong. You're not wrong at yeah, all. Yeah. So you put the band together, and and you put out the record in October. Uh, a stranger that you met before, uh, and I know you've got vinyl coming and all that, and that's just been a whole process. And you've been pretty much taking care of all of that on your own, right? Like as as long as I've known you, you're a one man show at least when it comes to the back end of uh of getting your stuff up i know you're on a label now which is nice yeah so uh i'm going to say i'm not on my own molly who has been my label distributor says this has mostly been from your muscle of your mom records uh, but i say like molly it's just been a lot of some of the parts of the whole so like just on the record part molly has been able to find us like environmentally and economically friendly like vinyl pressing via smash plastic and the reason why they're called smash plastic is they take records that never got sold or records that like didn't make the cut for whatever it might be yeah. and then they redistribute that that wax to make you know eco-friendly yeah. vinyl oh, um, cool. so then because of that the cost of it was was cheaper 
And then I would have never known to do that if Molly wasn't in my corner via Your Mom Records. Um, also, like, I said, all right, we're going to get it remastered. I don't know who to go to a vinyl remaster because I know play about mastering engineers. I just don't know any vinyl master engineers. So she happened to be friends with uh, Bobby Geel. I don't know who you, if you know who that is, but she's worked on a lot of very popular records. I'm just going to read some off from her website just to – <laughs> like give 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 all our vinyl uh ne- nerds uh a little bit of so I'm on our discogs. It's always cool to see who's worked with you, in my opinion. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I've been chasing that stuff down since I was a kid. Like that's how yeah. you, that's how you find bands, she, and that's how you yeah yeah. She, she's worked with Willie Nelson. <laughs> she's worked with Luke Combs, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, she's worked with Kenny Chesney, Reba McIntyre. Um, wow. And I mean, Grant Michelle Branch of all people. Uh, now granted, these people aren't in my genre, but they're very big Delta spirit. They're very big names. And like, granted, my record isn't a country or pop record. There's moments in the record that are very country. Right. Um, yeah. and I just thought that was like really cool. And she's a Nashville head. And then I had another person uh, do labeling for that. All of that was not my doing. That was Molly's doing, right? Um, now, the uh, album art that was done by Sarah of uh, Stone Cold Grace, all of that work was really done through networking. And it just kind of felt that, like, great, I recorded and got the record mastered in Philly and New Jersey. And with a lot of musicians I've met that you've known, like Aaron Fox and, and Brandon Bauer, et cetera, et cetera the record kind of became bigger than me. That's kind of like where I'm trying to get at. And uh, yeah, it, yeah. it felt humbling and also kind of awesome. Just like, I just didn't think that. And I still haven't like seen the record in hand. Like they're shipping out this month, like the pre-orders. And yeah. then I'll have a handful of them. I'll have like 30 to just sell on tour. And then uh, another spoiler announcement, we're going to do a second pressing and then I'm going to do another tour. <laughs> and then, and now oh, it's just great. a cycle. <laughs> see, yeah. yeah see see what you made for yourself right there more work yeah i, I really did in the most <laughs> literal way uh because i've already written a, a couple of already eps albums and stuff so yeah no that's great that's great and it's 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 cool to like have these people on a team but it's all very organic and everyone has a specific role that they fill and that you can then helm the the creative side which i know is always the thing that you've wanted i know in in, in your head you would give up control of certain aspects being like how do i get the vinyl pressed you know stuff like that yeah. but you'll never ever want to give up you know keeping your hands on 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 the creative force that is what you do that is 100 percent correct because the the busier i i get the more i wish somebody was like doing booking for me oh you yeah know? yeah like or uh sending out press emails just the whole nine like and it's not a complaint it's just more like I really would be a lot more efficient if all I had to do was show up and do the thing. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I, I run into that with me too recently too. As, as, as I was coming up to 300, I was like, I should actually do a proper press thing on my own. I just didn't yeah. have the resources to hire anyone. Uh, I have a lot of people in my, in my life, uh, who are excellent, you know, PR people, but I, the idea of going to them and asking them to do it for free or for like a, a, a deeply slash discount, I was like, I can't do that. Like I yeah. can't, I can't ask someone to do that, uh, and I can't wait till it's someone's idea to do that. So, Correct. Uh, um, so I did it myself, and I was the same way. I, I was like, I was doing that while putting out shows, like all through the month of like November, December, and being like, "This would be so much easier if someone could just do this for me." <laughs> yeah, 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 and and it's such a uh, middle ground around doing your own press and, and being DIY about that. Like, uh, I briefly worked with Jamie Coletta for like three or four like offhand sessions. I know and Jamie. She, I, I, I've never met her in person, but yeah, yeah. I, I know her through email and, and social media. And she gave me this like humbling advice. I'm not quoting her, but the, I'm, I'm sharing what I, I got from her is PR, especially for musicians is one of those things where you invest in, but you never know when the right time is because you can invest in it and you're not even ready for the PR you desire. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, she. I, I think she's absolutely correct right there. And there's just timing and all that yeah. too. Just like when you drop stuff and like, 
I knew at least for me, like I you you at least had stuff going in like in the in the earlier part of the fall, which is like a slightly more conducive time to be doing promo. Uh, I was doing mine in in the lead up to the holiday season, which in my head I was like. I'm already shooting myself in the foot right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, it, it's when the episode was coming out. Like I was like, well, I can't change that. Like, yeah, yeah, unless yeah, I go yeah. on hiatus for months, which I, which sort of defeats the whole purpose. Sure. No, no, you're completely <laughs> right. You're completely right. Yeah. Yeah. It's I. I hadn't not since I was in a band had I ever like gotten back into doing my own PR like that, and uh, I was both reminded that I'm good at aspects of it, and that there are other aspects of it that I just I. I'd rather I'd rather shoot myself. <laughs> yeah, I definitely hear that. But the record, like I said, it's it's out now, and uh, have have you been seeing some good response to it? At least like it being out on the digital platforms and all that. I'm not talking about numbers. You know, you you and I both agree that neither of us give a shit about numbers. But like just yeah. people talking people talking to you, like just kind of feeling the the actual like organic impact of it instead of you know numbers. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, and just to reiterate, numbers are just really a means to an end or something that's gonna kill your ego. But uh Yep. Or I both. would definitely say, yeah, yeah. I would definitely <laughs> say people have received it pretty well. Like I haven't played it as much as I desire to yet. But I have I have done some tour I did one tour on it. Um and I can definitely say like while like every tour shows are up and down, um it's been like consistent positive feedback no, no matter what. So, Excellent. Yeah, I feel good about it. Yeah, it is always tricky too um, when you get out because I know you definitely want to get out with with your band to do a lot of this because this is such a. What I like the most about the record, I like a lot of things about the record, but what I liked the most about it was like I could tell it was a step forward just creatively and a step forward like sonically, but also still one hundred percent you it's not like you flipped it all on a dime and it's just like oh now he's glossy you know yeah it's still very much the 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 way that you to get like kind of technical the way you produce your vocals and stuff like that like just the various sounds and tones on that i was just like this is just a slightly a slightly heightened version of like everything else that has come before um and because your voice is and 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 your lyrics and all that are such a key component of of what you do I think it was very important to not like change too much of that. Yeah. And the thing is like when it comes to music and, and vocals, I always think of each record as like a continuation of the next page. Mm -hmm. Uh, And something that I never told people, uh, but I'm telling now is like a day without love is supposed to be read as like a chronicling of human struggles but I want like the relief schedule to look like not so much the stages of grief, but more like different feelings of positivity and negativity. Not enough that it's swaying like a bipolar person, but enough where it feels like it's about rising above. Like solace was about rising above your own human struggle. Diary was explaining what the struggle was. Mega John was about, can I write with friends and Strange that you met before is how to make friends. See what yeah. I'm saying? No, <laughs> that's that's interesting. I don't know if I ever would have. Get, no, that's that that that's very cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, it's a more human story right there too. It's not a. Uh, it's not a manufacture. Uh, not, not, not manufacture, but like it doesn't fit into like a normal like what you consider a narrative because it's because it's a life and like that. Yeah. That, that stuff. It doesn't. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> exactly. That's that's the reason for that. Like adjustment and sound each time so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no but it it, it 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 like i said just the record itself sounds great like it's it's definitely from a from a from a production level it's you're you're definitely kicking it up a notch uh which which is awesome but again not so much that it's unrecognizable and not so much that some of us sit back and just be like what's he doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i never want that to happen and you know what some artists have that happen and it's like uh something that i'm doing now like for this current record is like I'm pulling from different influences that I've pulled before, right? So, like, I, I literally, when I ask my band, like, I know your your job is really to to rock and roll, but give me some feedback. Yo, is this a song? Is that a song? Are we throwing this away? Stuff like that. So it, I could still remain consistent, but moving a step forward. So, oh, right. sure, sure, sure. And and and, coll- and when it comes to collaboration, especially as you get into this writing process with other people, um, 
you're going to find that like they're going to have these ideas that you're just like, oh my God, I never would have thought of that. Like, exactly. And it's, and that, that's the joy of just working with other musicians or just other music minded people who have their own influences. And like, cause we all have our own things that we lean into. And when you're doing it by yourself or largely by yourself musically, at some point you can feel like I really, you you can feel like you've sort of exhausted your own well. Um, exactly. Which is never true. It's never really true, but it can definitely feel like that. And so if someone, like if your bass player is just like, oh, what if I just, what if we do this melodic thing under there instead of that? And your like brain explodes. You're just like, yeah. oh yeah, duh. And for him, it's like the easy, he's like, yeah, we'll just do that. And you're just like, mm. oh, okay. And then you kind of feel dumb for a second. And then you like, you're just like, no, it's not dumb. Like you just, I, your, your brain's only going to hold so many ideas. <laughs> exactly. No, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's great. It's great. And I know you've got stuff planned. Um you've got more tours and I know you're coming back through uh through town uh through through Philly at at the end of uh end of February and play Silk City. Yeah, yeah. I'll be playing Silk City uh and that works out perfectly because it's kind of a two in one week for me cuz uh I'm playing banjo and bass for another original Philly artist in the studio. Uh, oh, cool. Finishing up their record, and uh, I'm not going to announce their record. I'm just going to say that's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> and uh, then I'm going to be playing the show. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you, it's, it's it looks like a cool lineup. You've got you've you've, you've got that artist that you mentioned before, uh, Stone Cold Grace, uh, where yeah. the member of that had had uh, had done the album artwork for for the new album. And you yeah. got Sam Rosen. You got yeah. Sam Rye Bread. Yeah, and you might also know Stone Cold Grace as the singer of Caring Less. I think I do. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. You see, it's I, everyone kind of jumps around and forms new projects and like yeah. and and I I'll look up and realize that I don't actually know what anyone's doing sometimes. Sure. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Yeah. 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 And you've got Sam too, uh yep. who who I had who I have is is also coming on the show. I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to like bookend you guys together or something like that in lieu of the show or, or yeah. what have you um yeah yeah but uh, i mean i i have time to to figure it out you do but, uh i i finally had sam over uh we, we've been meaning to make that happen for for a while uh and that was a lot of fun and because i remember you guys had collaborated on a on an ep uh back back a few years right yeah yeah, yeah. she was the first um singer songwriter that i ever like did a proper collaboration with we wrote going and it was funny because I met her at Milk Boy and she's like, you should probably co-write with people. Um, and then it just became like a thing. Like I just co-wrote with people. And like, um, that's kind of something that I never thought I'd do, but, I, but I've, I've been doing it. So, yeah. She was sort of the, 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 the catalyst, the, the yeah. spark in your brain to be like, oh, maybe I can do this. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Because um, yeah. I, I know from that point on, suddenly I looked up and it was just like you, you had like tons and tons of singles. It's like you and Marceline, you and, you know, you you and all these people, like just separate things. And I was just mm. like, I, I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, oh, that's so cool because, you know, it is a community and some people do very well writing together. Some people also do very well just writing on their own. But I, I thought you did. I, th I think you do both well. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I, I do both. Like even around the record, uh, I wish I had promoted it better, but uh, I did like guest vocals for uh, an MC named Just JB, and they're based in Philly. Um, I literally got to experience Rock Philly because that's where we recorded it. Uh, yeah, so that was that was one experience. And then um, someone from Seattle, Washington, named Virtual Bird, asked me to do some vocals, so I like wrote some some words, and then I did instrumental guitar for a another uh musician slash poet in boston that was my first no it wasn't my first boston collab and that was like a whole time so like it just now it's just kind of like a, a natural part of the cycle like hey do you want to be on this record this is what you're going to do and yeah 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 and it de definitely leans itself towards a like just a richer artistic experience just to have yeah. just to work with all these people and just to be and to be like a small part of a project instead of like helming your own gigantic project that seems like sometimes it's it's getting away from you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and speaking of which too, because I I know I I've I've always I always tell people whenever they ask me, hey, how do you do a social media game that's also fairly like authentic and sounds like a person? Uh, and I often point people towards you. I said, I don't know. I said, look at Brian. I'm like, don't copy what he's doing because you can't. But like. <laughs> 
because you're not him. But yeah. I was like, if you'd like a blueprint of maybe how someone else is doing it, I often send people to your socials because I've always enjoyed just how like just frank you are about what it is to deal in in the business. And I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it because it makes them feel like a failure. It makes it seem like, oh, I'm having these difficulties. It means that I must not be doing it right. And you're very much on the side. It's like, no, it's not about you doing it right or not doing it right. These are simply the challenges and the pitfalls that you can fall into in trying to do anything creative. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I often send people in, in your direction just to be like, I don't know, just look at it. No, thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate yeah. that because... My last tweet before I went to bed yesterday was, "This is my student loan amount. This is how many stream. <laughs> this is how many stream. This is the average streaming uh, rate in Spotify. This is how many streams I need. Anyone else want to share? <laughs> 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 because uh, no, that's real. I mean, I've been in dangerously close positions. I'm still kind of in a dangerously close position where my budget did not match my ambitions." So I had to do like extra gigs or other side hustles or like just take out from my personal money to fund myself, you know, um, because I'm, I'm starting to acknowledge that like, yes, music can be a business. I have treated it like a business. I don't have to, uh, hate myself over it, you know, Uh, but but I, I should be vocal about it because I think it makes it more human. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, it's just like transparency. We've learned this over the many years, like with business and like and, and, and other sides of, of culture as well. When people are more transparent about like, well, these are the negative sides or these are the challenges. It's it's just it's real. And you're not it, it's not like you're trying to scare anyone away or be like, don't do it because of this. You're just being like, if you want to do it, just know that like you're going to run into like, you know, this wall here and this exactly. wall there. Like it's going to happen. I think that when you get up into the more major aspects of the music business, there's always someone there who like wants you to like not like, oh, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. It's like, well, someone like someone's going to run into that wall then. Uh, and it's going to and in my head, it's like and it's going to cost me money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because I've definitely found that some of my contemporaries that are on numbers doing better than me. Uh, if you look like, if you look at the numbers, there's really no difference. Like, yeah, more people are coming to their shows, but they're not making any more money. <laughs> yeah. It, it, marginally, it's really the same. So yeah. 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 Or, or, or the, the difference is so small. And and that's what I've learned as, as I've done more with like venues and stuff like that is that it, it works both ways. Like yeah. sometimes the increments like between of like a venue of one size and a venue that seems to be like 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 150 cap venue versus a 300 cap venue the metrics between that are nearly the same like even though you no. just doubled it exactly but going yeah. but going from 700 to a thousand is like exponentially larger like it's not it's it's not to the tune of 300 it's like it's huge and it's it's something I've like wrapped my head around as as people around me or else I have a lot of people around me who are like deep in the the venue and you know talent buying game and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just blows your mind and sometimes it excites me and sometimes it makes me want to throw my hands in the air and just be like I'm not, I I don't want to look at this anymore. <laughs> no, and I, and I love that you said that because like uh the last venue show I played in Boston, we played in a 135 cap room. Unfortunately, like I don't want to be anal, but I'm going to say 98 people showed up. I'm not going to say 100, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, great. We got paid. It was great. But when yeah. I looked at the breakdown, I was like, yo, these numbers would have been no different. Had if 135 played... people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, or, or even if we played like a 70 cap room. Now, also, it would have been very uncomfortable with COVID and all that stuff and everyone was safe. But like, I I love that you broke down that whole hundred versus three hundred, but seven hundred to a thousand is much different because it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, then you bring into the other aspects of venues too, which is like most standard venues are they're 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 working out of a food and beverage uh, line as well. Like, if yeah. you want to get technical about it, it's especially bar sales, like like club nights. You're not like. You pay the DJ a couple thousand dollars, you pay for security, and you've got your bartenders. And then all the money going out is just booze. Like, it's just people buying drinks. And there are times I kind of scratch my head and I think, like, I get it. Like, I, I get that it's a business model, but in my head I'm like, I don't know. Like, this is like we're, we're moving into territory that I become less and less interested in. You're, I like that you say that because, like, 
you know, I, I've run some events now in Philly, not so, I mean, not in Philly, in Boston, where like all of the people that work there, like the only thing that really matters is food and drink sales. I get that. But I think what a lot of people in that world miss, and this is where like the service industry and the music industry can meet in the middle, is like doing what colleges do. And that is create themes, create a reason to be there that doesn't rely on one source. Like, I think some of the best events are made because of karaoke night, pajama night. And I know it sounds very bro, but like, I feel like (laughs) today we've kind of unbroed ourselves. Yes, I'm making this word up as we go. Like (laughs) the invention of emo night has turned so cringe Yes. But it, op- it opened up the it works. door for the scene. Yeah, it works because, you know, if you're an original band, you can open up for emo night, still make some bucks, and people are going to show up. Yeah, yeah. Or you think about how it keeps these smaller independent, like 150, 200. Think about Kung Fu Necktie. Like, say what you will about the venue, about its 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 quality of backline to play there. I'm sure they're, they're I, I have opinions about it too. But they're always running like, emo night or you know millennial night or something like that yeah look at the pic and you look at the pictures and the place the places are freaking packed and and you think to yourself like there's part of me that's just like well you're supposed to be an independent music venue why don't you book more you know independent music and bands and stuff like that and then there's the other part of me it's just like but also like you get to keep the lights on so you know that's yeah we're so on the same page because it's like i remember there's this guy named joe i can't think of his last name but he ran up a few emo nights uh, just around Philly. And I noticed every emo night he had a band or an acoustic opener. And I was like, you know, integrating those two doesn't just keep venues alive. It keeps scenes alive because it like I think there was a time in, in Philly music where all you had to do was just play house shows. But so many things have happened where you gotta you gotta diversify like you know yeah so. yeah and 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 the house shows like they it's it's very balkanized like there's no there was no under there, there was nothing uniting it other than the bands themselves and maybe yeah. some of the audiences but the audience is a bit of a stretch too because like people will be like oh, i go to this house show and you'd be like oh have you ever heard of this house and it's like three blocks away and they're just like oh, i've never heard of that and you're just like okay that's a problem and it's no yeah. one's it's not the audience's fault and it's not necessarily the house's fault either but you're just like but that's weird because if they were clubs three blocks away from each other everyone would know like exactly it would it would be a district Essentially, yeah. it would be an entertainment district, uh, which gets different because it's also people's houses. It's just so, I don't know, it's, I came of age and as a band, like, just adjacent of the house boom in Philadelphia. It existed um, and was doing great things, but I was working in a genre that was, like, just slightly adjacent to it. Um yeah. And I used to think that we weren't welcome there because maybe we we came off as a little too polished. I learned later that that was all in my head, uh, and that like I could have reached out to any of these people. But it's just interesting to see this house scene. It's completely separate of, you know, business with a capital B, uh, and has launched some of the bands that have gone on to you know who have then gone and engaged with the business and gone on to to national uh, national success or at least uh, national opportunities. Yeah, there was a time where it seemed like house shows were as equal as any other club show. In fact, if sometimes not better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always will reference, I don't know if you know this, but I don't even listen to them. But I remember in 2013, I had a coworker who found out that uh, I was peers with the singer of Slaughter Beach Dog. Jake. Yeah. And it was only because we took the same train. That's the only reason. <laughs> and we and we recognize each other like, oh, we play with some of the same bands. And like, yeah. we would say, say hi to each other, right? So there's one time where he saw me get off the train and Jake said, talk to you later. And he's like, what do you know about music? And we started talking about music. And he's like, wait, these house shows are real? I thought they were just something you saw on the internet. So um, he goes, yo, do you know about that Menzinger show at the Golden Tea House? I was like, yeah, my buddy's like, help him do sound for it. He's like, well, I'm going to go. I was like, do you even know where the Golden Tea House is? Right. He's mm-hmm. like, no, but I'll find out. So I texted him and he's like, whoa, you know, I was like, yeah, go there like every <laughs> other weekend. Right. Yeah. 
What's the, now, the thing on the flyer? Uh, ask a punk, you know? Yeah, <laughs> ask a punk, right? And then, like, the thing is, he's texting me, like, you should go. And I was like, I feel like that show's going to cap in four minutes. I'm not going to go, right? Yeah, yeah. And guess yeah. what? It capped in four minutes, right? And he's like, he sends me this picture. And I mean, I don't still have it. But it made me have this whole aha moment, like, depending on what band you are, it yeah. does not matter if you play a venue, a bar, uh, or a house, a house yeah. or, or even a parking lot. The people <laughs> will show up, you know, because you're that big. And I mean, I don't say it's a hierarchy thing, but just some bands have it where that can happen for them, where it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. 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 And I think in, in in a specific example of someone like the Menzingers, uh, they're huge. I think it's, like, so, okay. Well, but but that was time and place for them too, because yeah. at some point they were. I mean, those guys were playing horrible clubs at, yeah, yeah. at one point in their career, and they came out at a time. I realize this more and more as I talk to people who are just like a little younger than me, like not that much younger than me. Um, is that like the massive shift once like MP3 blogs went away? like the massive shift in like how bands could get themselves into other markets and get themselves out there um, all for these things that were like largely, it's not unlike podcasts, largely just being done for free or nearly nothing by people who just loved it. Again, I missed that a little bit. Uh, I was more of a MySpace uh, <laughs> to age yeah. myself. That's I was yeah. more, we were more of a MySpace band. Um, but yeah, it was just interesting to learn that, that like that left a real gaping hole in like, how to be like, be like, I'm from Philly. How do I play in Boston? Well, MP3 blogs at one point were a way to do that. No, you're completely right about that. I mean, something that I've gained insight on, especially after this album release, because uh, like I'm very much still promoting it, <laughs> yeah. is internet press a la blogs are not dead, but they are just as choosy as we have to be that makes any sense no that, that that does make a lot of sense yeah so like that's a whole thing but what's very much in is like in person and digital podcasting like we're doing now because i've i've come to find out over the past four years i've developed quite a catalog of podcasts where someone's interviewing me in and i made a playlist out of it and little do i know at least once or twice a month Someone reaches out to me, not from Boston, not from Philly, and goes, hey, I've been listening to your podcast. And I'm always thinking, oh, streams, not memes, let's go. But no, they're interviewing me about me, like for music. So like- Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah no, that, that that happens to me sometimes too, um, yeah. where someone will come to me and like, oh, I heard you on this podcast. And I think the same thing. I'm like, oh, you're talking about mine? And they're like, no, I'm talking about this other one that I listened to. And I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's a thing. Like yeah, Exactly, uh, yeah. Which is odd, because when you're doing it yourself, you just like yeah, you're just in it's, a vacuum, it's, yeah, yeah, or not in a vacuum. I just I'm not paying attention to that aspect yeah, of it because exactly. there are so many other things you have to do. There's production, there's web hosting. I'm sending emails, I'm booking guests. It's just like being in a band. Like you kind of can't see what's going on around you, and it's not because you're intentionally like putting blinders on. You just there's only so much time in the day. True. So you're coming home in late February. It's You've got things to do. Uh, I think it's cool that you still. Do you feel like getting away from Philly? And I know because you came from here, and there's a whole other story right there about why about why you left. Uh, and I, like, just from me knowing you a little bit personally, I'm just like, it's true. I came here from somewhere else, so I feel the way that I do about here. But if I had come up here and like just you know been, been born in the area, lived here my whole life, I would have also gotten away. Yeah. at some point because yeah. you have to sometimes yep. like and i think people forget that like especially in a place in a big city that's you know full of so many people who aren't from here originally people could say it's like oh he 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 left because he doesn't like it here anymore and my answer is like no one likes where they came from like not really like true and you can sort of appreciate aspects of it more once you get away. Like I come from Rochester, New York originally, and when I got out of there, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. Uh, and now when I look back and I look at things that have happened since I, you know, it's been twenty over twenty years since I've been away. I'm like, I can appreciate certain things about this now that I couldn't before. Um, so I'm I'm curious when when you come back because uh, you have been coming back semi you know semi regularly. It's still kind yeah. of within that north that northeast tour circuit. 
I imagine there's still things that you miss about here and then certain things that you're just like, oh, my God, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, we would have to do another podcast about, like, that topic no, in know. general. But just, like, on a on a general level, there's just certain things I don't do here in Boston that I do in Philly. Like, yeah. sandwiches. Like, um, <laughs> I don't understand it, but for some weird reason, the pastries here are immaculate. Some of the oh, best up pastries. in Boston? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of the best pastries I've had in my life, right? But things like pizza, cheesesteaks, hoagies, or what they call subs, they're terrible. So I just don't eat them. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I'll have a pizza if it's there, but I'm not going to go out of my way. And there are two pizza places I've gone to that, like, I don't go there regularly just because of the price. But, like, yeah, I just don't go out of my way. And Yeah, um, that's so funny. And there's definitely been, like, some people I, I've even dated in my personal life, like, you think this is good? Come to Philly, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, I've, I've, yeah. I've done that. Yeah. Um, or, like, on the inverse, I really like the access to beaches here. Like, it's it's a lot wider than people realize. Whereas, like, very Philly, close. I, I don't miss that 90 minutes, two-hour drive to Jersey experience. So, like, there are some ups and downs, but, like, mostly, like, when I'm in Philly, it, it's it's mostly people and things that I miss. Places, not so much. Um, because, like, I don't miss that whole fighting to find a parking spot. Because Boston is dense, but it's not as populated as Philly. So most things here are, like, 20 to 30 minutes away. Whereas, like, Philly... It's dealer's choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, like, yeah. yeah, I definitely get that experience. And, like, if I ever were to move back, it's probably going to be a suburb move, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 and I don't blame you either. And I know a lot of people who are who are getting out of the city, like people – people who've been here for as long as I have, if yeah. not longer. And usually, I, actually, at, at my age, usually what pushes it forwards is kids and, and, and school. I don't have that it, either advantage or problem. It depends on how you look at it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have that. I, that. That's not a deciding factor for me. But, like, um, I will tell you, and it's not to, like, not to turn this a negative way, but, like, in the last two years, I have never thought about, like, getting out of here until, like, the last couple of years. That's um, real. Yeah, like yeah. the safety is way different, like in Philly versus it is, Boston. Yeah, like, and Boston, you know where I live. Yeah, you, you know where I live down there. Like it's not, it's not on my front doorstep. Like certainly not. Uh, yeah. I'm fortunate enough to live in an area that's, as I say, it's like we're just quiet and uncool enough that like no one messes, like no one messes with us one way or the other, either in a yeah. good way or a bad way. But that you know, I just just getting around the city, moving around like watching stuff like public transit like just slowly disintegrate in front of your eyes and then like I start making like I start having like conspiracy things about them like well they're doing this on purpose to get us all to leave here so and uh, it's ridiculous it's just my brain uh but <laughs> um but you know on public transit I just want to say two things one Boston is like significantly safer than than, than Philly and even though there's a lot of people that like to say that they're tough it's it's truly a tech hub full of music nerds, tech nerds, and medicine nerds, and that's okay. Are you talking about right? Boston or Philadelphia? Yeah, I'm talking about, I'm You're talking talking about, about Boston. Boston. Yeah. Philadelphia, no. I mean, it's got a lot of nerds, but it's got a lot of everything else too. But on public transportation, touring taught me this one thing. Whatever problems you see in your town or city, unfortunately – those are happening everywhere else. Too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, every, yeah, cuz I <laughs> yeah. I spent a I spent a lot of time in DC over the last year or so or in the DC area. Yeah. And while I will herald their public transit as being superior in many ways to Philadelphia, they st it's still the same bullshit. Still there, shit. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the train near near my uh, I don't take the Boston train because of the BS, you know. So Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just it's unreliable and like god, I haven't taken the I mean I haven't taken the L past Gerard in years. Like, why? It. Why would I? Like, yeah. Even though, like, some of those neighborhoods up there have opened up a little bit, and I was doing some work out of Port Richmond for a while, which I liked a lot. Yeah. Um, but I, I get it, and like, part of its age, and part of its like, I, I try hard. I, I have a hard time, and I don't know if you have this too. I have a hard time figuring out what's an actual problem and what is just me getting older. No, I mean, even when I was younger, I always said especially in the peak of the opioid epidemic. Yeah. 
pasture ride, you're opening yourself up to a world that you probably don't want to see. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's still true. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see what moves forward in the next couple of years in this city. Uh, exactly. I'm both I'm both reticent and like also I'm of two minds of like a Sherelle Parker or something like that, like our mm. our, our new our newest mayor, uh, where I'm just like, look, like I don't think that more police on the streets are a solution. I don't think that that helps things. But also, I'm just like, but there's also part of me I'm like, I don't know, man. But she got it, so let her cook. Like let's yeah. let's see what ha- let's see what happens. I'm like, my biggest thing is just like I do not want for like I, I do not want a freaking stadium downtown. I do not want. Yeah, um, I don't want that. Anyway, <laughs> now no, I'm, I'm gonna. This is a great conversation to bring a full circle because I know we're almost at the hour. Is uh, Boston's version of Xfinity Live is downtown and in the city. Yeah, and, and it's you know Fenway. It's the neighborhood, and seeing what it's done to the city on a pure numbers level, it's better for the budget of the city but terrible for people to live in. And I don't want there, that either. Because there the used thing- to be, yeah, there used to be a killer music room in the Fenway neighborhood. It was called yeah. church of Boston. Um, I heard about that. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I, I played there three times. Like, yeah. and I've gone and we've, and then it, it's a cool enough place where you play one night. And if you have a night off, you go back the next night because whoever's playing there the next night, you're just like, Oh, this is awesome. I want to see this. Yeah. Like, and it's gone. Uh, and I know a lot of that has to do with 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 the development uh, around Fenway, but yeah, yeah, because the, the cost of real estate and just basic things goes crazy. So like, I know I just talked crap on uh, the pizza, but like, I once got a slice at Fenway because I just had to eat, and they said, uh, yeah, one slice four fifty. I'm like, what? Four dollars and fifty cents slice of pizza? Where, like. And the slice wasn't like Sabaro size, you know, as far as really large slice. <laughs> it was like it regular was, size. It was a very regular size pizza. And I was like, That's so well, funny. there's nothing else open right now. So I got a slice. Yeah. And then I was like, just out of curiosity, how much is your bottle of water? And they're like, three seventy five. And I was like, a bottle of water and pizza is almost ten dollars. Like a slice, not two slices. Like I was like, Yep, Fenway did this. Because it's not all of Boston, it's just that neighborhood, you know. Well, because when people show up there, they're there to spend. Like they yeah. you, you go to the ball game, you paid for your ticket, like yeah. But like I I'm with you too because like that's what I'm concerned and I'm concerned too in, in Philadelphia that popping a popping a venue right there is gonna absolutely decimate Chinatown like it did in DC. Yeah. Um and like Chinatown to us, we're a very unique Chinatown in Philadelphia in that a large number of the property and business owners in Philadelphia Chinatown are also the residents. You can't say that about other Chinatowns. Exactly. Except for in LA. Um, yeah. Well, well, K- K-Town no. and all that. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise, like, I feel like this is a take. Chinatown yeah. <laughs> in Philly is the best yeah. Chinatown in all of the East Coast. I would very much get on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, that's I, just a fact. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I have a huge soft spot for like K Town in Los Angeles, yeah. um, and I have uh, and there's been other places in this country I've been to that I've said like, oh, this is a decent, this is a cool district here, mm-hmm. but Phil- there's nothing like Philadelphia's Chinatown. Uh, it reminds me of aspects of when I used to go to New York when I was a teenager in the late '90s, and we would go to Chinatown then because it was near the Bowery, but that was even kind of like gnarly and a bit of a dare. Uh, yeah, but. But it was still like, but it was vibrant, and there were things happening, and there was. What I like about Philly's Chinatown too is that we they have both the old school stuff that's been there for a long time, and there's that new generation of newer kinds of places. You know, roll like there's no mistake that the first rolled ice cream places were in Chinatown, like yeah. because it because it came from somewhere else. But yeah, exactly. Um, and then I, you know, and then I spent the better part of October in Japan. So like, I just. I had my brain. You have a bigger right reference well. point, exactly. No, yeah. yeah. Well, no, also, 100%. like, it just makes me sad now when I see things around. Uh, I was just like, I was in a place where it wasn't like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, but yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting too that that to you give me that that Boston perspective on there as well because like I'm not as active in going to Boston anymore as I as I used to be. But like, yeah, and something that I've noticed Boston's done around that like whole very. Uh, gentrified industrial area is they've built some music venues like there's Bill's Bar, there's House of Blues, there's also yeah. a Rockwood. But there's a Rockwood in Baltimore in, yeah, in, in, in Boston. Yeah, it's a, it's a very yeah, new one. It's like five months old. 
But oh, wow. they're all very corporate venues. Yeah. Versus like, you know, your O'Brien's, your Silhouette. Um, Midway Cafe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Midway Cafe, which are very much like the equivalent of a Kung Fu Necktie, you know, El Bar. Johnny Brenda's, so, yeah. Johnny Brenda's, right? And the whole thing is, I hope both can exist at the same time because I've seen it so much. Like so many cities happen, especially in tour circuits where like I played that really dope, like obvious music club. And then I come back the next year. This place doesn't exist. But here's a bunch of like Live Nation venues. And I'm like, ah. here's a city winery. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and no shade on city winery either. Like, I, in the end, it's like people are going to go to the places that they like to go to, that they feel comfortable yeah. going to, that just like kind of cater to the thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you too. I was just like, but there are two different experiences to be had here. And I'm not saying that even one is better than the other. Like, I'm not even going to be like, oh, well, you know, the CD dive is better than the, uh, than the Live Nation venue. I'm like, maybe, maybe not. That's just my personal preference. But again, I'm, I'm with you. I'm always just like, well, then just, just, just let, let the indies and the weirdos run these smaller cap rooms. It's fine. It's, it's scalable and they can handle it. And then like, yeah, if you want to go see a 3000 cap show, then like, yeah, you go to your Fillmore equivalent or something. And that's, that's fine. Like I, I got no problem with that. You go to your, it's, it's like when Brooklyn bowl popped into Fishtown and like, that's a less than 500 cap room. And I'm just like, I don't like this. Like, you know, that size of venue, both for the band and the experience, I'm like, is so unique. I don't know. I get worried when when I see corporations starting to get into the, ooh, smaller rooms are fun. I'm like, no, go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> go, go open a 10,000-person arena. Go open the spheres. Like, just stay yeah. stay out of our weirdo thing right here that barely makes any money. Sure. No, I agree. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. Well, dude – Record's great. I look forward to seeing you at the end of February. I'm going to try Thank to get you. out to that. I ain't been to Silk City in an age, so, yeah. um, you know, it's a... And I always love shows where, like, there's two people that, like, oh, I want to see them and connect with them and see them play, because it, it's it's exponentially more likely to get me out the door. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let that be a lesson to all bands. Just play with someone else I know, and I'll probably come. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but dude it was great to talk to you man uh i'm looking forward to seeing what what you get up to in the year man i'm always Thank you. where wherever you go i always still count you as be like he's still philly um <laughs> i guess i just want to let you know because of the way i talk people say the same so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love it man dude thank you so much man it's, it's, it's always great to talk to you thank you you as well Well, that's the show for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Brian Walker, for coming on, for talking, for being for being Brian Walker. Brand new record from him, from A Day Without Love. A Stranger That You Met Before, out now on Your Mom Records and wherever you get digital music. He's got vinyl for sale. He's got stuff. Go check it out, adaywithoutlove.com, adaywithoutlove.bandcamp.com. Do it all there. And of course, uh, he'll be coming back to Philly February 24th, playing with Sammy Rye Bread and Stone Cold Grace. Sammy Rye Bread, also known as Sam Rosen, famed producer over at Milk Boy Studios and future guest on the show. I have I have recorded that conversation. It has happened. It's coming out very soon. Um, spoiler. Or not spoiler. Anticipation. That's what that is. But yeah, Brian will be playing. Sammy Rye Bread will be playing. Stone Cold Grace will be playing. February 24th. 7 o'clock, Silk City. Go to Silk City, Fitty, Silk City, Philly.com slash events for ticket information. Like I said, go to a adaywithoutlove.com for information about all things Brian Walker, the music, his story, his podcast. He's got a great podcast called Dreams Not Memes. Uh, sort of on hiatus right now, but he's going to kick that thing back up again. Uh, tons and tons of great guests from all over the world, as we talked about in the conversation. All over the world. Very impressive. Always impressed at what Brian's been doing. That's going to do it for this week. I'm going to leave you with, with a track from, from the brand new A Day Without Love a record, A Stranger That You Met Before. The song is called High and Low from the new record. Get it everywhere you get digital music. Get it at your mom records. 
My name is Dan Drago. It's 25 o'clock, Philadelphia's longest running music podcast. I think until next time, take care of yourselves. Enjoy this tune from A Day Without Love. Oh.